I'm so depressed, Dr. Richard. I can't seem to shake it off. I've tried, but nothing seems worth doing. Is it due to the death of your friend, do you think? In part, yes. In part? You don't think it's the major factor in your present mental of condition? Of course it's the major factor, but I don't think it's the only factor. Our death has changed me, no use denying it. But it's forced me to reappraise my life. And to that extent, it's thrown me into a... into a state of confusion. In what way has it made you reappraise your life? Your writing? Yes. Since Mary's death, I've discovered I can't take the same pleasure in writing. I'm certainly tired of writing children's stories. Then why not try and write something else? Something more challenging? It would be difficult to find something more challenging than writing for children, Doctor. <laughs> Perhaps you're right. Before Mary died, I'd also lost a lot of money. Some overseas investments. All the money's gone. And I have no family, no one close. I can turn to for help and advice. Mary would have helped me if she'd been well enough. To that extent, Mary was my family, I suppose. I'm alone now. It's that fact which depresses me, frightens me. I see. You're what? Early 30s? 32. You're still a comparatively young woman. You've got many years in which to enjoy yourself, make new friends, enjoy new experiences. Look. I could prescribe tablets for your depression. It would be the easiest thing in the world, but it wouldn't solve the root cause of your problem. In fact, Miss Chaucer, I can't solve your problem. But if you can't, who can? Another specialist? No. You. You yourself. How? For a start, you have to get away. Right away. A fresh environment, a new locality. Abroad? Hmm? Not necessarily. Get out of London. Go into the country, find a small village somewhere. Make new friends, find a new rhythm for your life, and then rethink your future. And that's what I did. And that's how I came to meet Mrs. Crozier and Christina. Mrs. Crozier lived in a large stone house at the end of a small village. At first I thought I wasn't going to enjoy it much. The house wasn't very agreeable, not in itself. It was a good size, the rooms were well shaped and the windows were wide and looked out onto a large, pleasant garden. But the rooms felt both cold and stuffy. And there was a general air of damp and depression about the place, as if it had not yet been left to go to sea, but might one day soon. It's a lovely house, don't you think, Miss? It's very nice, Mrs. Crozier. It's only five minutes, less in fact. To the village store. You can get most things there. The garden is beautiful. Who looks after it? I do. All by yourself? Yes. That's amazing. You must work awfully hard. I spend most of my time out there, especially in the summer. The house is not mine, do you understand? Oh? No. I kept house for a family who lived here a little while ago. My husband used to do all the hard work in the garden. But when he died and the family left, well, I took it over. Something to do. And the new owner and the agent agreed that I could stay on and have the upper floor and the scullery kitchen downstairs for a small rent while keeping the place aired and generally tidy. But how is it that you're renting it out? Oh, it's with their agreement. And it's only for six months to begin with. The present owner works and lives abroad, you see, and is hardly here. He bought the place for his retirement and is wanting it occupied until he needs it. He doesn't want to let it get run down. Suits all concerned. Good afternoon, Miss. Hello, Mrs. Grosier. Um, I hope you don't mind me saying this. But don't you think I've been here long enough for you to call me by my Christian name? Oh, I don't know about that. Well, <laughs> if that doesn't suit you, Miss Chaucer would be a start, wouldn't it? Oh, very well, Miss. <laughs> <laughs> the radishes look good. Do you like them? Love them. Well, I think that'll be enough. Yes, it's warm, isn't it? Heat doesn't bother me. Gardening helps keep my joints moving, that's what I say. <laughs> Tell me, Mrs. Crozier, why is it 
But so few people seem to come up here. What do you mean? Well, just that no one ever comes visiting to see us. Well, you mainly. You must have lots of friends in the village, but they never call. I think people around here are too busy to spare the time looking about for things. Things? What things, Mrs. Crozier? What do you mean? You say it as if they expect to find trouble of some sort. I don't know what you mean, Miss. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Mrs. Crozier. Have I offended you? No, of course not. I don't know what you mean. Are people not coming here? They can come here if they wish. Nothing's stopping them. Excuse me. I'd better get these radishes cut and washed. I thought it was a strange phrase to use. Looking about for things. I admit it played on my mind for a while, but then after a day or two I forgot all about it. I saw Christina first on a damp, calm morning in the late summer when the sky was still sulky from an unexpected shower. She was standing in the garden in one of the flower beds looking down at something. She was a thin, pale-haired, rather grubby little girl of about nine or ten. I opened the window of my room to call to her. I wasn't quite sure what I intended to say. Not to walk on the flowers, I suppose. She didn't hear the window open, though it was stuck and creaked as I pushed it. She turned and walked away with unexpected abruptness and disappeared round the corner of the house. Oddly, the garden didn't look quite the same after she'd gone. It was like one of those unconvincing photographs that had been touched up. You can tell where an outline has been removed and there's something missing. Something inadequate. What was that you said? You saw what? The girl. In the garden? That's right. She was standing in one of the flower beds looking for something. I don't know what. A, a ball, I suppose. Did you speak to her? I opened the window, but before I could say anything, she had gone round to the front of the house. You didn't see her then? No, no, I didn't. A smallish, very fair-headed child, about nine or ten. I didn't think she looked very well cared for. She had a rather thin, thoughtful, obstinate face. She wore a pale green cotton dress. Well, Mrs. Crozier? No, miss. There wouldn't be any child in the garden that I know of. They don't generally come up here. I'm not imagining it. I saw her. She must have taken a fancy to playing here by herself. I hope she's not going to make a habit of it. I hope not either. As the doctor had predicted, the change, the peace, and slower rhythm of my life were having positive benefits. There I sat by the open window with the heady smell of pinks, the freshly dug earth turned by Mrs. Crozier, and the intoxication of crushed grass drifting upwards on the warm, early evening air. It was a supremely peaceful moment. And then... Oh, kitten. Oh, kitten. What? Oh, mummy. Oh, Mum. What is that? Is anyone going? Oh, kitten. Oh, kitten. Someone's outside. Mrs. Crozier? Is that you? Mrs. Crozier? Oh, Mum. Oh, Mum. In the shadows at the bottom of the garden. Someone's moving about. Oh, kitten. Oh, kitten. Oh, Mum. Oh, Mum. It's that child again. If that's you again, go home. Go away. There's no business here. It's gone now. It's gone now. It's all done. It's gone now. It's gone now. It's all done. It's gone now. It's it was the little girl of that I was sure. And there was something about now. this extraordinary gone ritual now. that I had to stop for the sheer sorrow of it. The feeling that I was unable to bear it any longer myself. I hurried out of my room and ran outside. But she had gone. You must have made a mistake, Miss. Not ill-treated in the real sense, perhaps, but... neglected. I can't help feeling that she comes up here for help. Love, maybe. 
Your writer's imagination, wouldn't you say so, Miss? No, I would not. I saw that child as plain as I see you now. I haven't seen any child, nor have I heard of one being ill-treated or neglected. And I know most of the people around here. Then perhaps I'd better go and see the local doctor. Maybe he can explain these hallucinations of mine. And can prescribe some treatment. I don't think that'll be necessary. It's possible. Well, it could be the grandchild of old Mrs. Baines. It might be her, you saw. Mrs. Baines is very sick. And her daughter come down from London with her own children to take care of her until she dies. I understand it can't be far off. You know what children are. They get bored easily. Especially if mother is busy. They have to be quiet about the house all the time. They roam about outside looking for something to do. And so they get into mischief. Yes, it's possibly Mrs. Bain's grandchild, you thought. And I believed this. For it seemed possible that there was something wrong with one of the London children. And that Mrs. Crozier didn't want to talk about it. I believed it. Until I walked down into the village one morning and saw the whole of Mrs. Bain's London family gathered outside the post office. And when I told Mrs. Crozier that I had seen them and that none of them was in the least like our garden visitor, she retired into herself like a hermit crab. Then one night, when the heat of the day had brought forth a parade of thunderstorms across the sky, I went to bed early hot, worried, and restless. The atmosphere was stretched taut and dangerous like an electric fence. There was no real darkness in the room, no sense of shadow or anything lurking, and most of the furniture was clear to my sight, so I cannot say how it was that one moment she was not there, and the next moment she was. The sight of the small hand, stretched out in a friendly, comforting gesture, was as unexpected as a scream on a sunlit lawn. I don't like the thunder. It's cold in here. Don't you think it's cold? No, I don't like the thunder. Do you? No. No. I don't. Why are you lying here? Aren't you uncomfortable? The bed's over there. The kitten used to lie on it sometimes. The kitten used to lie there. Soft. <laughs> she used to... <laughs> Oh, don't. Please don't go away. I don't like the thunder either. The bed's over there. You should be over there. Not here. Why don't you... It's all right. Honestly, it's all right. Please, come closer. Please. The kitten used to sleep there. The kitten. The kitten. The kitten. Good morning, Miss. Good morning, Mrs. Crozier. Nasty storm last night. Yes. I'd like to talk to you, if I may. Had your breakfast, have you? Yes. Always have a good breakfast. That's what my mother used to say. Sets you up for the day. The young people today go off with nothing in their stomachs except... Mrs. Crozier. Well, Miss? You have to tell me. 
The little girl. What little girl? Please, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You knew what I was going to say as I came along the path. Don't let's pretend anymore. The little girl. Did you know her? Was she a child of yours? Or a child of a friend of yours? Well, was she? Child. God, what are you on about that again? Look, I don't wish to be rude, but can't you leave it as it is? What made you say was? Do you know her? Since last night. She was in my room, and then she wasn't. She came and went as quickly as the lightning flashed. Who was she, Mrs. Crozier? You heard? You really heard? And saw her, Mrs. Crozier? Yes. Do you mean you haven't seen her? Sometimes. Sometimes I've been sure I heard her. Only I said to myself, no good would come of it. So I tried to shut her out. But they were very good to me about this place, you see, Miss. They? Her parents were dead, too. Then she died here? And she's come back looking for the kitten? I don't know what it could be, Miss. If it was her mother, I could understand why she's come back to taunt her. What do you mean? No, she didn't die here. Her mother did. But not the child. They were an uneasy, misfitted, upside-down family. Her dad thought the whole world of Christina. Christina? Is that her name? Her mother wasn't all there, I think. People said she liked to drink too much, but had been cured of it, but that her brain had never been the same. I never saw anything of that about her. But she was odd, no denying it. And she was very dependent on those two, Christina and her father. It seemed as if she needed them a lot more than they did her. You couldn't help but feel sorry for them. They went their own ways because he was a busy man. And a learned one, too. And though he was fond of the little girl, like I told you, he didn't spend much time with her. But you could tell how fond he was of her when they were together. And you could see Christina was fond of him back. Only she hadn't any time for her mother. Not that she could blame her. Except that it seemed unnatural. But she was a spiteful, sly woman, her mother. What about the kitten? She keeps mentioning the kitten. Oh, mummy. Oh, mummy. Oh, kitten. Oh, kitten. That's what she was chanting once. She killed herself. Who did? Christina's mother. She hung herself in a large cupboard in the room at the end of the house, the old stone larder. Mm. There was a big iron hook on the back of the door. Christina found her. Oh, my God. Christina found her? Yes. Opened the door, and there she was, hanging there. A sagging, shapeless bundle. She hardly said a word to the child. Came to me. I was working here for the family. Found me in the big kitchen. I remember I was kneading away at a pan of dough. She stood in the doorway and said, Mrs. Crozier, Mummy is hanging up there. And I can't get her off. She looks awful, Mrs. Crozier. And then she dropped down in a heap. And I was nearly up to my head of knowing what to do. Hmm. Christina's father was away, and I couldn't get Christina to come around or wake up properly. I thought she was dying, too. Oh, I don't know what I thought. Alone there in the kitchen, with her all flopped out, white as death, and only just breathing. Then the delivery boy came, and I left him with her and went to see. She slowly strangled to death, not broken her neck cleanly and quickly. I haven't forgotten her face from that day to this. Of course, her mother must have been unbalanced. But not to have thought of the child or the father. What they would find. How it would affect them. There was ill feeling in her, miss, for her to have thought of all that and still gone and done it. I still say, poor thing, well, there was so much misery in that family, with them wandering apart from her like that. You have to feel sorry for her. The kitten, well, miss, 
I think the child knew why her mother had done such a dreadful thing. Mm. No one ever rightly gets into a child's mind, but she loved the kitten. And she knew her mother was jealous of it. I always believe Christina felt somehow she owed her mother for what she'd had to do. As I said, Christina loved the kitten. So one day, she took it down to the pond and tied a brick round its neck and put it very gently into the water. Oh, my God. Then she ran away, crying fit to die. She never saw me coming round the end of the wall. And I didn't care to call out to her. But I saw it all. My breath was nearly choking me. But I went down by that pond on my knees and stuck my arm in and got myself all over green slime and mud. But I got the kitten out alive. Oh, it's famous. How could I give it back to Christina? I was there stuck. I had something of an idea of what was in her mind, but couldn't tell for sure. I gave it to a friend of mine, a quiet woman who lives down the other end of the village. She's a widow, too, and doesn't talk to folk much. So the kitten's alive? With my friend, yes. And she never saw it again? She thought it was dead? That's right. And that afternoon was her mother's funeral. And it wasn't long after that that they went away. They went away? And she's not dead. Christina's not dead. Oh, yes, she's dead, miss. Not that I ever saw her myself again after that. But she died, they told me, in a plane crash with her father. Oh. He thought a holiday would be a good thing for them both. She dwindled away after her mother's death, and he thought it was that. Well, it could have been. She was to wake shrieking. But I always thought it was the kitten that she'd killed with her own two hands. Or thought she had. Have you ever killed a thing, miss? Once, on a farm. I know what you mean. I'd have given it back to her if only I could. But how could I? It was a... It was some sort of a sacrifice she was looking for. If she knew the kitten was all right, what was she going to do next? I don't know, Mrs. Grazier. But did you ever think that she may not know she's dead? that she sees things as they were. She saw the bed where it used to be. It's a thought, Mrs. Crozier. Just a thought. Over the next few weeks, I saw Christina often, and Mrs. Crozier saw her too, I'm convinced. So she wouldn't talk to me again about it. But the one thing that badly troubled me was the unpleasant atmosphere at the end of the house where Christina's mother had killed herself. Once I had to go into the old stone larder in broad daylight to get the milk that was put there to cool. And the end of the room nearest the cupboard seemed to me to pulse, to throb, like a kind of wicked powerhouse. I told Mrs. Crozier, she said nothing, but she stopped putting the milk there. Then there were the nights when I wept. No child should still be lonely after death. It wasn't right. But the worst pressure of all was the growing feeling that the only thing I could do to help was to kill the kitten myself. I'd often gone down to see it. Christina hadn't shrunk from doing it, so why should I? I watched it one dull, hot afternoon. But I slunk home at last, unable to make up my mind how to do it. It was as I reached home that I sensed something was dreadfully wrong. Mrs. Crozier was nowhere to be found in the garden. And as I came along the back wall of the house, the throbbing came again. I looked through the tiny window of the larder, and there on the floor was Mrs. Crozier. She looked so small, so helpless. I rushed into the house and opened the door of the kitchen. As I did, the air brightened round me till it sparkled, and rings of light formed round my eyes as the blood was clamped into the innermost corner of my head. I sank to the floor, my head bursting with the unbearable pressure. And that inch by inch, I managed somehow to reach Mrs. Crozier. I grasped her arm and tried to drag her from the room. 
but it was a shoe made of solid bronze. I was unable to struggle any longer. Then, the precious of enlightenment. The outer door swung open, and there, silhouetted against the shining light, was the child. Christina. Don't move. I've got the kitten. I've got her. See? What? What's happening? You are silly, Mrs. Crozier. I said, I've got the kitten. Don't move, Mrs. Crozier. Please keep still. Christina? Christina? Yes, Daddy? Come along now. Time to go. Coming, Daddy. Coming. Come on, Next morning, we heard from one of the village boys that Christina's little cat had strayed across the road and been run over by a car. It had died at once. As I reached home, that I sensed something was dreadfully wrong. Mrs. Crozier was nowhere to be found in the garden, and as I came along the back wall of the house, the throbbing came again. I looked through the tiny window of the larder, and there on the floor was Mrs. Crozier. She looked so small, so helpless. I rushed into the house and opened the door of the kitchen. As I did, the air brightened round me till it sparkled and rings of light formed round my eyes as the blood was clamped into the innermost corner of my head. I sank to the floor, my head bursting with the unbearable pressure. Yet inch by inch, I managed somehow to reach Mrs. Crozier. I grasped her arm and tried to drag her from the room, but it was as she was made of solid bronze. I was unable to struggle any longer. Then, the precious of enlightenment. The outer door swung open, and there, silhouetted against the shining light, was the child. Christina. Don't move. Oh. Oh, there you are, my lovely. It's all right now, Mrs. Crozier. I've got the kitten. I've got her. See? What? What's happening? You are silly, Mrs. Crozier. I said, I've got the kitten. Don't move, Mrs. Crozier. Please keep still. Christina? Christina? Yes, Daddy? Come along now. Time to go. Coming, Daddy. Coming. Come on, Next morning, we heard from one of the village boys that Christina's little cat had strayed across the road and been run over by a car. It had died at once.
whole of Mrs. Bain's London family gathered outside the post office. And when I told Mrs. Crozier that I had seen them, and that none of them was in the least like our garden visitor, she retired into herself like a hermit crab. Then one night, when the heat of the day had brought forth a parade of thunderstorms across the sky, I went to bed early, hot, worried, and restless. The atmosphere was stretched taut and dangerous like an electric fence. There was no real darkness in the room, no sense of shadow or anything lurking, and most of the furniture was clear to my sight, so I cannot say how it was that one moment she was not there, and the next moment she was. The sight of the small hand, stretched out in a friendly, comforting gesture, was as unexpected as a scream on a sunlit lawn. I don't like the thunder. It's cold in here. Don't you think it's cold? No, I don't like the thunder. Do you? No. No, I don't. Why are you lying here? Aren't you uncomfortable? The bed's over there. The kitten used to lie on it sometimes. The kitten used to lie there. Soft. <laughs> she used to... <laughs> oh, don't. Please don't go away. I don't like the thunder either. The bed's over there. You should be over there. Not here. Why don't you... It's all right. Honestly, it's all right. Please come closer. Please. I admit it played on my mind for a while, but then after a day or two I forgot all about it. I saw Christina first on a damp, calm morning in the late summer, when the sky was still sulky from an unexpected shower. She was standing in the garden, in one of the flower beds, looking down at something. She was a thin, pale-haired, rather grubby little girl of about nine or ten. I opened the window of my room to call to her. I wasn't quite sure what I intended to say. Not to walk on the flowers, I suppose. She didn't hear the window open, though it was stuck and creaked as I pushed it. She turned and walked away with unexpected abruptness and disappeared around the corner of the house. Oddly, the garden didn't look quite the same after she'd gone. It was like one of those unconvincing photographs that had been touched up. You can tell where an outline has been removed and there's something missing. Something inadequate. What was that you said? You saw what? The girl. In the garden? That's right. She was standing in one of the flower beds looking for something. I don't know what. A, a ball, I suppose. Did you speak to her? I opened the window, but before I could say anything, she had gone round to the front of the house. You didn't see her then? No, no, I didn't. A smallish, very fair-headed child, about nine or ten. I didn't think she looked very well cared for. She had a rather thin, thoughtful, obstinate face. She wore a pale green cotton dress. Well, Mrs. Crozier? No, miss, there wouldn't be any child in the garden that I know of. They don't generally come up here. I'm not imagining it. I saw her. 
She must have taken a fancy to playing here by herself. I hope she's not going to make a habit of it. I hope not either. As the doctor had predicted, the change, the peace and the slower rhythm of my life were having positive benefits. There I sat by the open window with the heady smell of pinks, the freshly dug earth turned by Mrs. Crozier, and an intoxication of crushed grass drifting upwards on the warm, early evening air. It was a supremely peaceful moment. And then... Oh, kitten. Oh, kitten. What? Oh, mummy. Oh, mummy. What's that? Is anyone going? Oh, kitten. Oh, kitten. Someone's outside. Mrs. Grosier? Is that you? Mrs. Grosier? Oh, mummy. Oh, mummy. In the shadows at the bottom of the garden. Someone's moving about. Well, you, mainly. You must have lots of friends in the village, but they never call. I think people around here are too busy to spare the time looking about for things. Things? What things, Mrs. Crozier? What do you mean? You said as if they expect to find trouble of some sort. I don't know what you mean, Miss. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Mrs. Crozier. Have I offended you? No, of course not. I don't know what you mean. Are well, people not coming here? They can come here if they wish. Nothing's stopping them. Excuse me. I'd better get these radishes cut and washed. I thought it was a strange phrase to use. Looking about for things. I admit it played on my mind for a while, but then after a day or two I forgot all about it. I saw Christina first on a damp, calm morning in the late summer when the sky was still sulky from an unexpected shower she was standing in the garden in one of the flower beds looking down at something she was a thin pale haired rather grubby little girl of about nine or ten i opened the window of my room to call to her i wasn't quite sure what i intended to say not to walk on the flowers i suppose she didn't hear the window open, though it was stuck and creaked as I pushed it. She turned and walked away with unexpected abruptness and disappeared around the corner of the house. Oddly, the garden didn't look quite the same after she'd gone. It was like one of those unconvincing photographs that had been touched up. You can tell where an outline has been removed and there's something missing. Something inadequate. Was that you said? You saw what? The girl. In the garden? That's right. She was standing in one of the flower beds looking for something. I don't know what. A, a ball, I suppose. Did you speak to her? I opened the window, but before I could say anything, she had gone round to the front of the house. You didn't see her then? No, no, I didn't. A smallish, very fair-headed child, about nine or ten. I didn't think she looked very well cared for. She had a rather thin thoughtful, obstinate face. She wore a pale green cotton dress. Well, Mrs. Crozier? No, miss, there wouldn't be any child in the garden that I know of. They don't generally come up here. I'm not imagining it. I saw her. She must have taken a fancy to playing here by herself. I hope she's not going to make a habit of it. I hope not either. As the doctor had predicted, the change, the peace, and the slower rhythm of my life were having positive benefits. But I give it back to Christina. No. I was there stuck. I had something of an idea of what was in her mind, but couldn't tell for sure. So I gave it to a friend of mine, a quiet woman who lives down the other end of the village. She's a widow, too, and doesn't talk to folk much. So the kitten's alive. With my friend, yes. And she never saw it again. She thought it was dead. That's right. And that afternoon was her mother's funeral. And it wasn't long after that that they went away. They went away? And she's not dead. Christina's not dead. Oh, yes, she's dead, miss. Not that I ever saw her myself again after that. But she died, they told me, in a plane crash with her father. Oh. He thought a holiday would be a good thing for them both. She dwindled away after her mother's death, and he thought it was that. Well, it could have been. She used to wake shrieking. 
But I always thought it was the kitten that she'd killed with her own two hands. Or thought she had. Have you ever killed a thing, miss? Once. On a farm. I know what you mean. I'd have given it back to her if only I could. But how could I? It was a... It was some sort of a sacrifice she was looking for. If she knew the kitten was all right, what was she going to do next? I don't know, Mrs. Grosier. But did you ever think that she may not know she's dead? That she sees things as they were? She saw the bed where it used to be. It's a thought, Mrs. Crozier. Just a thought. Over the next few weeks, I saw Christina often. And Mrs. Crozier saw her too, I'm convinced. So she wouldn't talk to me again about it. But the one thing that badly troubled me was the unpleasant atmosphere at the end of the house where Christina's mother had killed herself. Once I had to go into the old stone larder in broad daylight to get the milk that was put there to cool. And the end of the room nearest the cupboard seemed to me to pulse, to throb, like a kind of wicked powerhouse. I told Mrs. Crozier, she said nothing, but she stopped putting the milk there. Then there were the nights when I wept. No child should still be lonely after death. It wasn't right. But the worst pressure of all was the growing feeling that the only thing I could do to help was to kill the kitten myself. I had often gone down to see it. Christina hadn't shrunk from doing it, so why should I? But to go into the old stone larder in broad daylight to get the milk that was put there to cool. And the end of the room nearest the cupboard seemed to me to pulse, to throb, like a kind of wicked powerhouse. I told Mrs. Crozier, she said nothing, but she stopped putting the milk there. Then there were the nights when I wept, no child should still be lonely after death. It wasn't right. But the worst pressure of all was the growing feeling that the only thing I could do to help was to kill the kitten myself. I had often gone down to see it. Christina hadn't shrunk from doing it, so why should I? I watched it one dull, hot afternoon, but I slunk home at last, unable to make up my mind how to do it. It was as I reached home that I sensed something was dreadfully wrong. Mrs. Crozier was nowhere to be found in the garden, and as I came along the back wall of the house, the throbbing came again. I looked through the tiny window of the larder, and there on the floor was Mrs. Crozier. She looked so small, so helpless. I rushed into the house and opened the door of the kitchen. As I did, the air brightened round me till it sparkled and rings of light formed around my eyes as the blood was clamped into the innermost corner of my head. I sank to the floor, my head bursting with the unbearable pressure. Yet you know, inch by inch, I managed somehow to reach Mrs. Crozier. I grasped her arm and tried to drag her from the room, but it was as if she was made of solid bronze. I was unable to struggle any longer. Then, the pressure suddenly lightened. The outer door swung open, and there, silhouetted against the shining light, was the child. Christina. Don't move. Oh. Oh, there you are, my lovely. It's all right now, Mrs. Crozier. I've got the kitten. I've got her. See? What? What's happening? You are silly, Mrs. Crozier. I said, I've got the kitten. Don't move, Mrs. Crozier. Please keep still. Christina? Christina? Yes, Daddy? Come along now. Time to go. Coming, Daddy. Coming. Come on, Next morning, 
We heard from one of the village boys 